Hello and welcome. Thank you for being here. We're having a couple of YouTube technical difficulties, but hopefully we will get it all sorted out. Uh, good evening and welcome to Resetting the Table, a conversation series that unites artists, activists, experts, uh, to engage in a rich dialogue about gender and public policy. This programming series, which is free to the public, is part of the new play No Pants in Tucson, a play about gender oppressive state laws and is produced by the anthropologists. Uh, I wanna welcome ASL interpreters, Cassie and Claire from Inclusive Communication Services. Thank you so much. My name is Melissa Mishido. I am the producing artistic director of The Anthropologists. I am joining you tonight from the unceded territory of the Lenape people. For a brief visual description, I am a white woman with dark curly hair, a raspberry colored top, uh, sitting in my home office with a bookshelf behind me. Founded in 2008, The Anthropologist is dedicated to the collaborative creation of research-based investigative theater that inspires action. We use theater to engage with challenging questions, to recontextualize the present and reimagine our collective future. Our motto is where art meets action, and that is the reason why we are here tonight. Uh, so before we begin our conversation, I would like to acknowledge that for many of us in New York City, today was a particularly challenging day. Uh, this morning, there was a shooting at a Brooklyn subway station that injured several dozen people and was pretty terrifying. Add to that that we are still living through a pandemic and witnessing a war in the Ukraine, and it is a lot. So I wanna thank everyone who's tuned in tonight for joining us, especially in the midst of all that's going on. Tonight's conversation is urgent and it is intended to dispel myths and answer questions and give us tools for taking action and help us envision what a better future may look like. So let's begin. First, I would like to welcome our first panelist, uh, Aviva Cantor. Aviva is, hello, a primary care physician's assistant and one of the medical providers at Callan Lord Community Health Center, a health center that focuses on the health needs of the LGBTQ community. Aviva's work is rooted in increasing uh, health care access and improving health outcomes and educating future medical providers and the community. Thank you. Uh, I am now pleased to welcome Renee Appel, who is a gender-free New Yorican advocating for intentional mental resilience and well-being for trans, non-binary, and gender expansive folk. Uh, Renee received their master's in social work at the New York University and has been privileged to support young adults at Hetrick Martin Institute, Trinity Place Shelter, the Ackerman Institute for the Family, and Montefiore's Hospital's first LGBTQ youth program, the Umbrella Program Serving Youth and Families. Most recently, Renee was a mental health therapist at the Oval Center and the Adult AIDS Clinic at the Montefiore Medical Center in the Bronx, and is currently the director of the Gender Diversity and Resilience Program through the Child Guidance Center of Southern Connecticut. They work in private practice from a health equity framework. Thank you, thank you for being here. I have some reports that my internet is spotty, but I hope I am still connected to you all, and I am just so grateful to be in conversation with you. So um, to start us off, please tell us a little bit more about you beyond your impressive bio. Uh, like what does, does your work look like? Um, how did you get to doing what you do? 
Renee, you want to hop in first? Sure. Um, thank you so much, Melissa, and thank you so much um, to the theater for, for having me be a part of this panel. Um, I really appreciate the intention behind this conversation and this work. Um, so I'm just very grateful and appreciative. Um, so I'm coming to you tonight from unceded Lenape land um, for a brief visual description. Um, I'm a pretty tiny person generally with short, short red hair and a blue button down shirt. Um, uh, so um, what brought me to this work, I think the, the um, correct term now is like identity based work. Um, but um, I was uh, in undergrad um, doing more and more research papers on the trans and non-binary community. And I remember one of my professors, um, very tall, lean person with big Coke bottle glasses and crazy gray hair and was reading my like fourth or fifth paper on, on the trans community and looked at me over her Coke bottle glasses and said, research is me search. And... Mm -hmm. <laughs> it called me out, <laughs> like called me out to myself as like a young um, trans and gender queer person of, you know, me doing my, my using my, uh, the privilege of my education to also learn about myself. Um, I think through that work, I've really identified that um, healthcare and particularly mental healthcare are huge disparities for us culturally, but also issues that have impacted um, myself as well as many of the people that I love and care about. And so I found myself at the intersection of healthcare and mental health care uh, and my community. So that's how I got here. Um, I'm currently at the Child Guidance Center in Southern Connecticut. I'm going to do a shameless plug um, that for the Gender Diversity and Resilience Program, um, which is not quite a year old yet. We provide individual group and family mental health counseling and support, as well as psychiatric care and case management for young people through the age of 18, anywhere in the state of Connecticut, because we're privileged to be able to do care virtually. Um, we also are partnered with a medical provider um, who provides care for trans and non-binary folks of all ages, um, doing primary care as well as gender affirming specific health care. Um, so if folks have questions about those things, please go check out our website. Um, yeah, thank you so much for having me. Great, thank you. Thank you for sharing your your journey with us. Aviva, welcome. Tell us a bit about you and um, who you serve and how you serve. Sure, thank you so much for having me. I've been um, really excited and I think my coworkers, uh, my work are very jealous that this is something that I get to do tonight. Um, for a visual representation, I am a white, sadly middle-aged woman, cisgender, uh, mop of curls on the head, clear glasses, um, and polka dots as usual. Um, and I came to this work uh, initially through AmeriCorps 20 years ago. I wanted to do HIV testing and counseling and was placed in, and instead of doing testing and counseling, I ended up in a, in a hospice setting and it was around the time that some of the HIV meds were starting to work and people were not necessarily dying anymore. And I became very, very interested uh, from a non-clinical point of view in HIV. And then I um, met my first physician assistant, found out about PA school, went to PA school, and my studies were primarily focused, or my, my focus was prim primarily focused in HIV. And through that work, I um, became connected to the LGBTQ population. And then um, have worked in several um, HIV healthcare organizations. And then about 10 years ago, I was very lucky to be able to get a position doing primary care at the Callumore Community Health Center, which um, Melissa mentioned is um, a health center that meets the needs, it focuses on the LGBTQ plus community, but also serves anyone regardless of their ability to pay um, and uh the, the true goal is to increase access, decrease health disparities, and truly provide dignified care to everyone. And it's, um, it's a place where people work and they're really passionate about the work and um, I'm very, very proud to work there and very, 
honored to have the patients that I get to work with. So um, we have about 15,000 patients we serve a year. Um, I'm an HIV specialist and I run our HIV program, but I mean, really half of my patients are TG and are transgender and non-binary identified. And um, much of what I work now is actually in HIV prevention and just routine primary care, gender affirming care for people. Um, and, you know, we're seeing patients every day and uh, watching as the healthcare landscape changes and access improves very little by little, but um, being a part of it is really, is really exciting. Thanks again for having me. Thank you. Thank you for sharing about your journey to this work. Um, you know, one of the goals of this conversation is to sort of break down any barriers, especially when it comes to communication. So I think this is a great moment in the conversation to for the two of you to help us define some of these terms so that we're all listening from the same foundation. So I'd really love to hear from you about, you know, Aviva, I heard you use TGNC, which I've become very familiar with, but for someone who's hearing it for the first time, can you um, tell us what that stands for? Sure, it is an acronym that can mean um, a variety of things to different people, but in general, TG is uh, short for transgender, and NB or NC can be non-binary or non-conforming. So when we are talking about people of transgender experience, um, we're talking about people whose sex assigned at birth, which was assigned by a medical professional or their parents based on their external genitals, does not match their gender identity. And, um, you know, there's a binary that people buy into, right? So you, have, you can have a transgender woman who identifies as a woman whose sex assigned at birth is male. You can have a transgender man or some kind of transmasculine experience assigned female at birth and uh, their gender uh, is male. Um, and then non-binary is really along a, a spectrum and it can mean you know, different things to different people, but it means that they don't uh, necessarily assign to the binary. Um, and different people use different terms to describe their identity and it's very personal to them. Um, and then just as another, I want Renee to also like to, to come in here, but uh, you know, cisgender is someone who's sex assigned at birth matches their gender identity. And, um, and then just a note for people who this might be new to them and we're talking about, you might hear people talking about sexual orientation or romantic orientation, just to know that that is very different than what we're talking about here and that who someone loves or is, um, or, or prefer sexually or is romantic with is very different than their identity. And so what we're talking about is gender identity. Tonight. And we may talk a little bit about sexual orientation too. But. If I can piggyback off that, there's like a really great, I'm not sure if Laverne Cox is the originator of this quote, but there's a really great Laverne Cox quote, mm -hmm. gender identity is who you go to bed as and sexual orientation is who you go to bed with. I love it. <laughs> right? <laughs> Brilliant. Um, I think the other term that I may throw around a little bit that I just want to add to that, especially because I've spent the majority of my career working with young people, um, is people who are gender exploring. Um, so folks who might not have a word that they use to describe their gender identity just yet, or they're doing some internal and external work to figure out what gender identity works best for them. Um, this is not exclusive to young people. Identity exploration is healthy at all ages, um, but particularly normal and healthy for adolescents who are exploring all kinds of parts of their identity. Thank you so much. Sorry, I was muted for a moment. Um, I really appreciate you diving into that with us. And I'm curious, you know, I think now more and more people are hearing the term gender affirming healthcare and maybe understanding what that is or having a limited understanding of that. So I'm curious from your perspective, um, what does that how would you define it? And has that definition changed at all over time? Yeah, Rin, you want to start and I'll, I'll piggyback. <laughs> sure. Um, so I think how I often use gender affirming healthcare 
um, is a sort of all-encompassing or umbrella kind of healthcare to talk about healthcare that is affirming someone's gender identity and expression. Um, so this can look like pubital blockers, so medication that's introduced um, to put a pause on puberty for folks who are exploring their gender. Um, this can also look, look like things like gender affirming hormones, so estrogen or testosterone. Um, so folks go through a puberty that best aligns with their internal sense of their gender. Um, this can also look like things like surgeries. Um, that said, I think I also define this uh, a little bit more broadly in that gender affirming healthcare is anything that creates what um, what the community is calling gender euphoria. Um, so a feeling of connectedness, excitement, or elation that you feel um, when you are vibing with your gender and other people are vibing with your gender with you. Um, so gender affirming care can look like pap smears or um, GYN care that is affirming and supportive and thoughtful. It can look like cancer screenings that are informative, that are affirming in terms of words that are used um, or practices that are done. Um, so this can this can be a lot of different things. Yeah, um, to, to, to add to that, I would say when we're talking about how, how broad gender affirming care is, I mean, I include the training of, of um, support staff and front desk people and your referral partners and if you're referring to someone to cardiology to make sure that people understand how important it is to use the correct pronouns, how important it is to use people's uh, their their names that might not be the names on their insurance cards. Um, at our at our practice and I'm sure in other practices in New York, you know, we have people who come in for pap smears who identify as male and sort of having the resources in the and the team available to make sure that, you know, I, I can honestly say that insurance will deny a pap smear, a cervical pap smear being sent for uh, someone identified as male. So having the resources available to make sure that there aren't, you know, bills being sent to the patient because insurance denies care in that setting. Um, it's also, um, you know, understanding that not every person that presents is going to want the same experience, just like in people who are cisgender, right? It's like just because someone presents and wants a specific type of care, it, it doesn't mean that they want something that someone else who identifies as someone has. And that's really like the, it's individualized care that is also affirming of their gender and, and doesn't centralize their gender either. Um, you know, one of the things I talk about with patients when I refer them for uh, behavioral health or for therapy is they tell them how important it is to make sure that when they're in that protected space with someone who's caring for them and that they're not spending their time teaching their therapist about what it means to be transgender, non-binary, and you know, making sure that we have the referral set up, that they can meet people who can support them and be able to talk about, like everyone else, talk about their mothers, you know, instead of just talking about their gender identity and their expression. Um, and um, another, just another aspect of it is that for many of our patients who are, um, who would like to have gender affirming surgeries and would like to have name changes on their documents and their passports and their IDs is making sure we have the resources and we know what we're doing when we are signing paperwork, legal documents for them that support them um, in getting their needs met. And, um, And yeah, there's actually many other parts to it, you know, it's, 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 but it's. Thank you. That's really um, making me think about something that we were talking about just before we, we started, which was this, this connection between medical care and mental health care. And certainly it's, um, that's been an evolving conversation just in general about people being so much more open about mental health care and seeking therapy. Um, so I'd love to hear more about that and, and also this specific relationship between, uh, for the trans community and the gender expansive community between medical care and mental health care and how that intersects. I can, I can do a little here, I think. Um, when, you know, at, at Callenlord, for example, we, we have um, our medical primary care setting and urgent care and sexual health care. And then we have um, 
behavioral and mental health, including short-term um, mental health care and long-term um, therapy and psychiatric care. And you know, the, the needs of patients changes over time, right? So like when people are gender exploring or when people are initially transitioning, they might, you know, part of gender affirming care is to decrease distress um, that people have you know, as they are um, you know, managing their transition or dealing with dysphoria. And so the mental health needs change over time depending on how much trauma someone has experienced, what they've been excluded from their family or just their own internal exploration. Um, and I have to say, just, I mean, I've been, I haven't been doing this for that long, but, you know, 15, 20 years, there's been a huge change in how people access care and what kind of care that they, that they need and not to talk about mothers again, but um, you know, even five, six years ago, people would come and present to care for medical and mental health care, and they would be on their own. And I have to say, in the last five years, more and more people are showing up with their mothers, and it's made a huge difference. Mothers are not always on board, but they are there uh, with their kids, um, you know, trying to make sure things are safe. I'm sorry to go off track a little bit here, but um, but in general, just just to say that the needs of people over time regarding behavioral and mental health care, I think, have changed, and then in general, and then also related to the individual themselves, will change through their life. Yeah, I I think like to talk about this from the from the mental health perspective, from from the training perspective that I come to it with, like gender affirming healthcare, especially things like hormones or gender affirming surgical procedures are like the only time um, that I know of that a mental health diagnosis is used to inform medical care. And so that's a really unique position that mental health providers are put in. And I think historically that has felt um, daunting or confusing to folks who are coming from a mental health training. Um, however, the more that the community has advocated for ourselves in saying that actually we are in charge of this care, we are the experts in our own lived experiences, we come with the expertise for this, and um, the more that that framework has radically shifted. Um, and research study after research study affirms that when folks' gender dysphoria is alleviated through a medical intervention, it shifts a whole host of mental health care outcomes. It reduces depression, it reduces anxiety, it reduces instances of self-harm, it reduces um, suicidal ideation and suicide attempts. Um, and so it, I think it speaks to the importance of the mental health it speaks to the importance of the mental health implications of this care, but I also think it's a really tangible example of how uh, we as a like Euro Western US culture keep separating mental health and medical health. And maybe in fact, <laughs> they are much more closely related than, um, than our system has been set up for. Yeah, absolutely. And thank you for naming all of those incredibly um, important outcomes um, that are so dependent on this access to care. Uh, you know, one of the things that we've been trying to untangle in these conversations, in these resetting the table conversations has been like, what is the difference between legal policy and cultural policy? So, you know, sadly, we're seeing a, a whole slew of laws that are being proposed and passed that are um, that are anti-trans in many different implications. Your your assistant came, Renee, um, fired up about this this portion of the conversation. Um, and you know so those have real like legal ramifications but some of what you both were sharing um implies the cultural policy like 
who can know about this care? Like Aviva, you sharing that there are many more mothers and parents who are joining their children for this kind of medical treatment versus someone doing it all on their own. Um, that feels to me like a cultural policy shift, that it's okay to be outwardly uh, supportive, um, which is just such a, a beautiful thing. Um, so I'm just in, interested in that nexus um, and how each influences the other. It's like, as we've had more, uh, an expansion in the cultural sector, it seems like it's having the adverse effect in the legal sector. I don't know if you have thoughts and about that or reactions to that. Um, yeah, I, I, I think one of the things that is most exciting about the work you all are doing is bringing in history. One of the things that um, we hurt ourselves with, I think, as a culture, is our propensity to forget our history. So in some ways, this feels so strange that culturally we're seeing more non-binary people than ever before. And yet we're seeing more anti-trans legislation than ever before. And also this feels like a repeat of other ways that we have persecuted and oppressed other communities. So, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about like how we've created legislation around um, uteruses and ovaries in the past, right? And legislating what decisions get to be made about those body parts to subjugate a class of people. Um, when those people we're moving into places of power, right? We're moving into a workforce. We're having more independence over uh, their finances. We're having more autonomy and decision-making in culture. And we're like doing the same stuff all over again. Mm -hmm. um, and like, which is just so disheartening, um, but also maybe a little hopeful in that, in that we know how to get through it. Um, but I, I really think like the more visible and loud um, trans and non-binary folks are being, the more there is a pushback to eradicate trans people from public spaces and from access to spaces um, as, as like a arm of, of misogyny. Um, so um, yeah, I think it, it makes, in some ways, it, it's history repeating itself. Um, I, I do think it's important that um, we we talk about like the very real cultural implications that legal decisions have, right? That um, as this bars, especially young people, from access to quality, thoughtful, knowledgeable providers, um, this may result in um, underground economies for taking care of healthcare needs which we've already seen in other communities before. Um, and this also is, is increasing mental health concerns for young people across the country, whether or not they're in the states. Um, they're seeing policies being made about themselves um, and about their worth. And that, of course, is affecting their mental health. Absolutely. God, you, you've encapsulated so much, just so uh, beautifully and compellingly. Uh, when we started to create No Pants in Tucson, um, we were looking at archaic U.S. state laws. And now I have a different um, personal definition of how I view the word archaic as it's not necessarily like, oh, these things that happened a long time ago and the laws are still on the books so they could still be used and weaponized. But now seeing this legislation, these legislations being passed, and it's really an archaic mindset or this false idea that a law can um, prescribe gender. And we've seen over and over again how law attempts to prescribe gender. So the, the play itself begins with an 1883 ordinance from Tucson, Arizona that prohibited, essentially prohibited women from wearing pants. 
I have my little show Bible here, the book that we re referenced a lot called Women in Pants. Um, and it explores these early anti-masquerading or anti-cross-dressing legislation as a precursor to today's abortion bans and anti-trans legislation. So while we were researching and creating the play, we discovered so many stories of gender expansive people. And I always include the caveat that, you know, a lot of these stories are coming from the mid 1800s um, using a very different vocabulary. So terms that we are familiar with or embracing today, like non-binary, uh, transgender, even gender non-conforming did not exist in the lexicon. Um, but we can certainly, like you were saying, Renee, see that history and it's so powerful to see it reaching back. And we've only gone back 150 years and we know that it's, there have always been trans people. Um, so many of the stories that we found and, and these were all being cataloged uh, in newspaper articles that were reporting on trials um, or arrests. So we're very mindful of where we're finding these stories. Um, but many of them, many of these individual accounts took place in a medical setting. And oftentimes, you know, so it was a, it was people being denied healthcare because the way that they presented did not match their gender assigned at birth or their at birth gender was discovered um, by needing, requiring medical care. And, and so many of these individuals then it led to involvement with the police rather than getting medical treatment because of some of these laws. So while these stories are 150 years old, some of them, we continue to grapple with this disparity. You've already started to get a little bit at like why, why this still persists. But I'm curious if there's, if that brings up anything else for you. Like why the discrimination still exists or the uh, yeah or the, why, why um why I, this is a question of the the <laughs> decade right like why are we trying to resolve medical issues or concerns with the law versus care yeah yeah um i mean there's a, a there's there's a, a, a lot to to sort of unpack here, right? I mean, there's, we could talk about um, medical providers and, uh, and behavioral health providers like refusing to treat people based on their gender expression and their gender identity and causing real harm to people. I mean, there's, there's many examples of that, um, which is why places like, you know, places like Callum Ward and places, you know, these LGBTQ organizations sort of people got together and were like, we need to provide care for ourselves because no one else is going to take care of us the way that we need to be taken care of. Like, there's there's so many examples and it continues to happen. And I get referrals uh, from people all the time who have been treated so poorly and uh, and negligent, negligent, yeah, anyway, so, or so poorly. Um, but I also want to bring up the fact that, you know, that the, the, the focus on bodies and particularly on uteruses and actually um, is is gender affirming care and not the way that we think of it is has been provided to cisgender people forever um, against their will I would say against children who were um, born identifying as you know, or born as intersex you know with maybe what the medical community refers to as ambiguous genitalia they've had surgeries you know performed without their children but performed without consent for years um, causing lifelong harm um, and that is, in a way, I mean, that's sort of gender, not really affirming, it's gender care of some kind, but it's certainly not gender affirming care that we see it, but it is care that is confirming some kind of gender for, some, for someone else's needs, right? But that is for cisgender or as a, you know, as a child, they're considered cisgender care. Um, and also polycystic ovarian syndrome, PCOS, um, which for uh, people with uteruses and ovaries, it's a hormonal um, disorder that for not everyone, but for some people, um, you know, causes excessive hair growth and, um, and weight gain and 
other kinds of like hormonal imbalances and people aggressively treat PCOS and people with PCOS probably against, you know, what people want to be treated. Um, and that again is like some sort of gender confirming, affirming care that many people don't even want. It's just so interesting the way that they, they want people to have uteruses and ovaries in like such a specific way. Um, and there's such a focus on fertility and the ability to have children and, how, and the definitions there. Um, and so it's just, it's so interesting that there are these laws that continue to take away the rights of people based on their gender identity and expression that literally harms no one. And that we continue, people continue to provide medical care to people that, that does in fact harm people. And there's lots of, lots of people's experiences that would say that the medical community has harmed them in, in some way. Um, yeah, there's, there's, there's so much to talk about, right? So like the fact that there's already so much harm happening and then they just continue to layer on the like ability to just cause more harm and more barriers for people that already have so many barriers. Keep going. Yeah, I I think so so true that it, it is like layers of of barriers to care. Um I so as you're talking about this and thinking of if um I'm borrowing from the the work of Alok Vaid Menon, um, who is a trans um non-binary a uh, spoken word artist and writer and um, has some truly amazing books. Um, but in in their work, some of what they talk about is um, the sort of colonized and patriarchal culture of seeing people with uteruses as fertility, as the purpose of making children. Their, their, um, their domain was in the home. Um, and so some of these stories that we hear of people dressing in masculine clothing was simply to leave the house, was simply to do something to escape their subjugation. Um, and I think we see that reflected in healthcare law, right? And anti-abortion laws, that there is a, a means of um, reinforcing subjugation, reinforcing a gender role um, through legislation of the medical community. And this feels so similar to, to what's happening to trans and non-binary folks who are pushing against the definition of womanhood or femininity doesn't need to be connected to fertility. It doesn't need to be connected to my body or my uterus does not need to have that as its purpose. That is not my role. Um, and that's probably really scary for people in positions of power who want to maintain their power, that there's a whole other group of people not only pushing against that role, but really dismantling this system, um, introducing, introducing things to say like they're actually, this disrupts having power over another group of people. Um, so that legislation of healthcare is really trying hard to like reinforce some <laughs> savage uh, oppression um, of, of folks who have always existed. Like we've been here as long as there's been people. Um, Absolutely. I, you know, and, and in these stories that we've found and with this one law that on its face, you read through it, you're like, oh, it's very mundane language about how someone can dress you know not dressing as the opposite sex and um and the 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 actual ordinance goes on longer than that but it's very kind of boring almost technical language and then the way that it is weaponized and the arenas that it is used in and the people who it's used against it you know it came up around voting rights and women trying to get jobs so that they could earn more um, and be self-sufficient um, women wanting to uh express their gender express their sexuality sort of like all the things that you that you have just hit upon renee um i'm sure many of our viewers tonight, along with you, are aware that there have been 
a spate of new laws that are trying to be passed. Um, and th this statement now is already outdated, which is as of March 2022, 15 states have restricted access to gender affirming care or are currently considering laws that would do so. There are um, more that have been proposed and or passed in April. Uh, and some of these laws go as far as to make it a crime for parents to advocate for their children to receive gender affirming care. So I want to dig in a little bit more about both what's at risk here, and Renee, you've spoken to some of that already, and you as well, Aviva, but also like for us, those of us who are living in a state where this legislation is not being proposed or has not been passed, um, you know, does, does that matter? Like what what is the, how are we connected even when we're looking at state law? And I, I don't know how, I, we don't have someone here on the panel from the legal perspective, but anything that you can bring to that is is great. I mean, I think that our, our, our patients and the people that we serve who are able to access, and our family and our friends who are able to access healthcare where we live, it's a real concern if they want to leave the state or travel or, uh, you know, consider jobs and promotions and going to school in other states. Like, it's definitely not something that we can feel, I mean, um, my kid's school has a, a gender exploration club in their elementary school, right? Um, it's amazing, yeah. but but we're deep, deeply in a bubble. Um, but we also understand now, you know, especially in the last couple of years, like we're all starting to really deeply look outside that bubble. Um, whether you are part of the community or an ally, and and you know, trying to make sure that people are getting heard and sharing information and and sharing information about what other states are doing as far as their laws go, who you can call and what you can do, um, if you can do it. Um, I think it is, not, it is not something that is unique to those states. I mean, people sort of take it for granted that one of the many privileges that you can go anywhere and do anything, you know, it's just not the same. I mean, it's just not the same for people who are at risk of losing their, their, medical, um, their medical care. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think it, you know, we we say like we live in this liberal utopia um, in New York City, um, but it really like what this does is legislating groups of people out of spaces. Mm -hmm. um, so one of the interesting things I think about, and Aviva, I'm sure you've seen this too, about providing health care in New York City is we have people who come to New York City from all over the country. Um, our, our homeless youth population, especially um, for LGBTQ homeless youth is heavily populated by young people who have moved from our country's Southern states because they know they cannot get the safety and access to resources that they would there. Um, and so it's creating homelessness, it's creating migration within this country for access to basic things like housing and healthcare and education. Um, so it really is legislating whole communities of people out of their homes. That's a, an incredible, um a terrible ripple effect of these laws. Um, we are going to have a few action steps for people to take um, towards the end of our conversation tonight, which I'm getting so much out of. Uh, so many of, um, so, so our work is all based on research and source material. Um, so for this play, the research encompassed legal text and newspaper articles from the late 1800s and early 1900s. Uh, in a few minutes, we are going to be sharing a, a, an excerpt from a piece from our digital story, digital storytelling series, where we invited artists to create a short piece inspired by the research archives. 
I'm particularly excited to share a piece coming up that is about the life of Murray Hall, um, who was a New York City politician from the late 1800s. Um, and this was a person who we explored a lot in rehearsal and ultimately um, did not uh, become part of the full production. So I'm so pleased that one of our performers, Kian Johnson, was able to create some art using Murray's story. And um, for those who've never heard of Murray Hall before, Murray was a New York City politician that lived his life fully as a man um, and his, whose gender identity was revealed upon his death when he died from untreated breast cancer. So an example then of someone who did not pursue medical care because they knew that the risk to their identity was just going to be too great um, and tried to self-treat and ultimately um, was unsuccessful. Um, but I think that it's, it's this reminder, this voice from the past reminding us just how critical it is to make um, healthcare available to people of all genders without judgment. So we're going to play the excerpt of the song there. And if you have questions that you would like to ask uh, our panelists, Aviva and Renee, please add them into the chat and we will, we will ask them. At last it was cancer that ended his days, but he bought book on book. To stave it away, tried to cure it himself, but needed surgical help. By the time he saw a doctor, it was too late to quell. Most of the stories we have of Mr. Hall are the shock revelations the press captured with awe. Hardly one word remains of Murray's turn of phrase, and the saddest fact of all is he wanted it that way. So that's just a short excerpt. I really encourage you all to follow the link in the chat to listen to the whole song that Kian created. Um, it will be stuck in your head and it just like gives you a window into a little bit of a lost history and it is one of uh, 12 pieces that we have up in our digital storytelling uh, series, and you can view the whole thing on our website. Um, it's a whole range of different projects inspired by the people we discovered while researching this, this play. So if you do have a comment, pop it in. I've got plenty of questions to keep asking the two of you about your work and your thoughts here. Um, I would very much like to encourage our audience to take a meaningful step tonight um, to support both the work that you're doing and to let legislators in other states know um, that this kind of legislation does nothing but cause harm. Um, what, if, if there's one thing that you can, um, identify like a change that you'd like to see in the general, the awareness of the general public, what might that be? Either of you can hop, hop in. Sure. I mean, I, I think one of the things that my, my patients struggle with the most is, um, the expectations of of community and for the general population um, just doesn't understand that each person is an individual and their path is different from everyone else. Um, and just it, it, all people are not the same. And so one person's experience is not going to be the same as another. Um, and what person's um, dysphoria is not going to be the same as another person's dysphoria. And um, their goals are not going to be the same. And um, sort of second to that, and this is just for like anyone who will listen, is that it doesn't matter who you are. Nobody's genitals are your business. There's no reason to ask anyone about their genitals unless you're about to do something. 
it is, I mean, it's like sort of funny, but it's also surprising how much people think that they can just ask questions about genitals at any, any time. To coworkers. Ah, this blows my mind. Um, I want yeah. that as a t-shirt. <laughs> <laughs> Let's do it. I love it. Yes. I know. I mean, like, seriously, like nobody's genitals are your business or could you Google this? Um, yeah. is, is the the one's the front, one's the back. Yeah. Like that's also my advice to medical providers who are supporting and working with trans and non-binary folks is quietly reflect to yourself first. Could I Google this? Um, <laughs> but yeah, I think maybe the the change that the one change that I would ask for that is a much larger change is the the cultural and systemic understanding that there are varieties of gender um, for for trans people, for non-binary people, for intersex individuals, right? Like there are just varieties of gender, and there are varieties of bodies that can go along with or not go along with that gender. And I think if we were taught biology properly um, about the varieties um, in sex and gender, if we were taught history properly, um, if, if we were taught that this is a normal and healthy variation in humans as long as we have been here, uh, that that just like one little change, I think, could really shift a whole. <laughs> I, I like. There's part of me that wants to. Um, well, I affirm that so deeply, and there's part of me that wants to be so encouraging as I see like my own children and their journeys in gender um, and and what they're learning in their elementary school, which is really embracing of identity and, and um, very forthright in talking about gender identity. And then I, it just breaks my heart to see the legislation being passed in other states that are prohibiting, explicitly prohibiting that kind of education, which just is, is so backwards. Um, so incredibly frustrating. So I did, I, but I don't want to end on a frustrating note at all, because I do believe that the more voices that are out there um, speaking up against this, the better. So we do have some action steps that I'm going to pop into our chat right now. And then I'm also going to ask Renee and Aviva to share how we can help support their work. Um, but one easy thing that you can do tonight before you go, and I'm going to put it right in here, is sign the Human Rights Campaign's Count Me In pledge to show your support for trans and non-binary equality. So there is a link there that you can follow and read that pledge and sign that. Um, Renee, Aviva, how can we support you and your organizations? Uh, I mean, I work at Calmore Community Health Center and they, you know, we are, we are always needing more resources. So certainly you can donate. And I think there's a link that you can donate to Catholic Board uh, to support our programs. Um, but I really think the most important thing is, uh, is standing up for each other and standing up for the communities uh, and protect communities. I know that's not what you're asking, but I think that's really the, the, the most important thing that I would say is that you hear people, um, hear people using wrong pronouns, discriminating to communities in general, um, microaggressions, macroaggressions is, stand, is to stand up. I think we've learned in the last couple of years that it really does matter, no matter who we're, who we're talking about, is to not let, not let those aggressions slide. They really, it means something to stand up for ourselves and for our communities. Thank you. Support comes in, in many forms. Renee, how can we support the work of your newly formed organization that's just turning one? Yeah, so um, while the Child Guidance Center has been in Connecticut for um, quite some time, um, the Gender Diversity and Resilience Program is not quite a year old. Um, but you can support the Child Guidance Center, who we're actually doing our largest fundraiser 
of the year in May um, by checking out our website. And um, please give us your hard earned money. That would be great. Um, but also like a few other options that um, I would suggest. Um, so uh, one, vote if you are able um, or help sign people up to vote if you are able to do so. Um, the second is giving um, your volunteer hours um, or your finances to the Trans Lifeline. Um, it's the only uh, trans run by and for trans people, suicide and mental health crisis hotline um, in the United States and also into Canada. Um, we also collect research and data. Um, so they're the reason we know that when legislation like this gets passed in certain states, there is an increase in calls um, for suicidal ideation and self-harm, right? So their data is the reason that we know this and we can advocate for the mental health of trans and non-binary people. Um, and the other thing is support Black trans women, support Black trans-led organizations, um, hire Black trans people, um, give give your give your dollars to the community. That is the reason that I exist. That I have this job. That um, our community is here. Thank you, thank you for that. I, I was able to put the the link in for Trans Life uh, Lifeline and the volunteer link in there. So check that out. These are all just beautiful ways where we can use our voice. We can give our time. We can give our, uh, dollars if we're able, but this, this is truly just such a critical issue. And there's so much, um, there's so much at risk and there's so many lives that can be improved by joining together for this. Um, so before we go, I, for one thing I want to say, Renee, when I first looked at your website, I got so excited with this image of the astronaut floating out in space as a gender explorer. And I just like loved that so much and showed my kids right away. Um, but as, as we are on this beautiful uh, journey, this cultural shift of people exploring gender and just opening their awareness to it, um, I'm just wondering if you are able to like hold to the side the the very real legislation that is um, that is being proposed here, but just put it to the side for a moment and you envision a future without that. Like what is the the future that you are hoping for for your patients, for yourself, for your children, for those of us who have young ones? Yeah, so um, in thinking about this this program that we've we've started, like my hope for the future is that programs like this don't need to exist. Um, I, my hope is that we can put ourselves out of business and hold and recognizing that trans, non-binary, and gender diverse individuals like, we're just a variation in people. Um, and so therefore, <laughs> this is included in, in our education systems and our trainings and our healthcare and our schools. Um, and so we put ourselves out of business, like that would be great. I agree. I say that about my work in HIV as well. My job, my, my hope is to not have this job, uh, but, but also, you know, not needing these sort of organizations that pick up where other people have really And, um, you know, I hope that in the future that communities can exist like this just to celebrate. Yeah, like we should keep the parades though. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> like keep the really great parties, but like the rest yeah. of it can go. <laughs> keep the anthems. Yeah. Beautiful, beautiful. Thank you so very much Aviva and Renee for sharing your experiences, for teaching us so much tonight, giving us so much to think about um, and for sharing your beautiful visions for what our future could and, and should look like. Um, I really appreciate being in conversation with you both. 
I want to thank our interpreters, Claire and Cassie from Inclusive Communication Services. Thank you for so beautifully signing um, the conversation. I can't wait to go back and look because I just love the poetic gestures of your work and, and that um, storytelling in and of itself. Uh, if you would like to see more of our digital content, we're dropping the link in there for No Pants Digital. I want to thank our streaming technician, Michelle, for making tonight's program go so smoothly, even with our technological hiccups that I caused. Um, and please stay in touch. We'll, we'll drop a link in there for how to join our email list. Um, if you'd like to attend more events, we're hoping to bring back the live production of No Pants in Tucson later this year. So look out for that. Um, and we'll also put a link in there if you want to see past episodes of Resetting the Table. So thank you, thank you, thank you. So much gratitude. Uh, thank you and have a wonderful night.